Hey guys, it's Bridgette with San Diego Seed Town. <laughs> Hold on, I need to. My throat's really dry. <clears throat> hey, baby bear, will you bring me a water bottle? Got a dry throat this morning. <clears throat> hey guys, it's Bridgette with San Diego Seed Company, and today I'm gonna be talking about the four most common mistakes that people make when growing their fall transplants. I'm gonna talk about four things that you need to look for to troubleshoot what's going on, why aren't they growing great, what's the issue, and I'm gonna make sure that you don't make those same mistakes by explaining everything you need to know to grow your fall starts. Now before I get into that, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button so you're notified anytime we put out a video. So here we are in my seed starting laboratory, my fall seed starting laboratory, which you'll notice is not in my greenhouse because my greenhouse is a bajillion degrees right now. This is where we start our seedlings in the fall under the shade of a beautiful jacaranda tree on the north side of our, of our house where it's a lot cooler. If you check out the video we did last week, you can see why I started these crops. I give you all the very important details on how to start your seeds, specifically how to plant them, how to grow them in the fall. Now we're gonna look at how they're growing and I wanna teach you how to recognize the four top issues that you typically see when you're starting seedlings. So we're gonna start with number one. I've got my little, my little cauliflowers here, my amazing cauliflowers and they're not looking so amazing. Well, why is that? This is a very common thing that happens, particularly with fall crops or um, your brassicas, so broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower. In zone nine and 10, you plant them in the fall so they can grow through the fall and the winter. In other zones, you'll actually plant these uh, indoors in early spring uh, or late winter and plant them out in early spring. Regardless of how you do them, if you're planting them in an area that, that bugs have access or insects have access to your starts, you're gonna probably notice something like this. You come outside, you look at your babies and you go, what in the world? They're like totally gone. What is this? They're just nibbled down. You can see, this is a really good example. This one here also is, is completely mowed down. This one as well. What is that? A lot of people get confused, they're not quite sure. Um, some people might say it's rodents. Uh, if it was a rat there'd be, or a mouse, there'd be nothing left here. This is the damage of a uh, cabbage looper or some type of leaf-eating caterpillar. Now the telltale evidence is, if you look and see, you can see some poop left over here. See some poop down there. And you can see how they're just eaten right along the, the ridges of the stem. That's because the little caterpillars crawl up the, the stems and they eat all the young tender leaves. This is a very common problem because these are really young and delicious. Oh, here's some more poop. That's a nice little turd for you there. It's on my finger. I have a turd on my finger. So I'm actually, oh, here's another really good, look, there you go. If that's not evidence enough, I don't know what is. That's a nice pile of, of caterpillar turds. If, if you were to not pay attention to your babies for a couple of days, and there's enough of them, you could come out and this whole tray would be practically gone. So I need to catch this in time to, to fix this issue. Now, how do I fix that? A couple different things I can do. There's a product called BT, which stands for bacterial thermogenesis. It's a naturally occurring bacteria in the soil that they bottle up. You can use it on or organic farms or gardens in your home garden. It is a very specific insecticide that targets leaf eating caterpillars. So you can spray that on your baby starts. It does take more than one application for really good coverage. And what happens is it, the caterpillars come in contact with it and it basically breaks down their metabolism and they, they end up dying. It is a way in which you can protect your babies so that they can continue to grow. Once they get big enough, no little tiny caterpillar is gonna make a, much of a difference. But when they're small and young and tender like this, if you don't protect them, they can easily get destroyed. This is the evidence of probably, I'd say uh, a couple of days of neglect. That's how much they've been eaten. So you really have to stay on top of it. That's one way you can solve the issue. The other, ish the other way you can solve it is if you're starting indoors, 
you may not have as much uh, insect population inside your house as I do outside. And you can simply go through and try to find the caterpillar, which sometimes they're easy to find, sometimes they're not. And you can hand pick them off and likely you can get them under control that way. Now, because I'm growing these outdoors without any protection, I'm going to have to spray them. After I spray them once, maybe twice, I can use an insect netting to cover them to protect them further. Now you might be thinking, well, how does that work? That's because the way in which the cabbage loopers or any leaf eating caterpillars get onto your crops is a moth or a butterfly comes and it lays its eggs on the soil or around the plant. Those become the caterpillars. The caterpillars eat your baby's uh, plants. They grow up, they become a moth or a butterfly, they fly off, the life cycle continues. By covering them with something like an uh, uh, insect cloth or row cover works really well, you can prevent that from happening. But the caveat is you gotta take care of any that are hidden on here to begin with. So quick spray of BT will take care of that. So that's most common problem number one. Okay, number two, what I see happens so often. Good example here is overcrowding. I talked about it in my last video last week about how these really needed to get plant planted out. Well, I planted out one of the three trays. I got busy, I haven't had time, and I'm gonna give you a really good example of what that overcrowding looks like. If we look at the bottom here, you can see that these have really overgrown their cells. Now, the reason why this is a problem is if this bottom tray dries out, which could very easily happen in our hot weather. And these roots are sitting here in this dry tray, in a black, hot, dry tray. They are gonna be the first things to fry. These roots need to be in contact with water to continue to grow. And if they're not, they're gonna die. The plant is going to suffer. So at this point, I have less room for air because they have simply outgrown their area. This has to be filled with water or have a couple inches of water in it as a reservoir almost at all times at this point because the roots are so tangled up and are outgrowing their space. The other issue is it becomes very hard to pull them out without damaging them. Look how long that root is. This needs to get into the ground. The longer it sits in this tray, the longer it will take to adjust when you plant it out into the garden and it will be stunted. We don't want that. We want these guys to really thrive. The other thing is there's more than one uh, seedling in this little cell, which is really a no-no. I really want one per cell. It's gonna be very difficult to take these apart without ripping through a lot of these roots, which is okay, you can do, but in our hot, dry climate of zone nine and 10, the more roots you rip through when you transplant, the more likely the plant is going to wilt when you put it into the ground. So I really wanna avoid this if I can. In this scenario, I have no choice. I overseeded, I left them in too long, the roots are, are way overgrown, I'm gonna to have to break them up. We are gonna post a video on exactly how you wanna transplant your fall plants into the garden and the top things you need to know about that. But first thing, don't let your plants get overgrown. You have, you have two choices here. Either these get planted into a bigger pot where they can continue to grow until I plant them outdoors, or they can go directly in the garden. I'm gonna plant them directly in the garden. We have a couple days of pretty cool weather, and so I wanna take advantage of that and plant them now. The next thing I wanna show you is not enough sunlight. Here's a good example. See this right in here? Well, this was supposed to be spinach and it didn't work out very well. And that's because these other two plants grew so quickly, they overcrowded and not enough sunlight came into these cells here. So they're very few and far in between. They're pretty leggy. They just don't look great. That's something to consider when you're planting your seedlings in a tray is is, are one of the plants gonna get really big and, and overcrowd or shadow another area of your tray? If you are growing indoors underneath lights where you can control the situation and the lighting you know, to the T, maybe that doesn't matter as much. For me, planting outdoors, especially because I'm planting 
under dappled shade because it's so hot, this is ever more important. I really have to pay attention and ask myself, are my plants getting enough sunlight? This is a good example of them not getting enough sunlight. Our fourth issue that is very common in the garden, which is kind of a catch-all issue, is just pure neglect. I'm gonna be really honest and open with you guys and, and really bear it all here on the camera and show you that, you know, sometimes even the best of gardeners <laughs> don't spend enough time in the garden and they neglect their plants. This is a prime example. These guys have been neglected. They are, um, I, have, I have not been consistent about watering. You can see that green that is on top of the soil. That is a product of having the seedlings sit in moisture for too long. So be moist for too long of periods. It's actually a fungus that's growing on top. Oh, I don't know if you caught that little insect flying out of here, but that was a soil gnat. That also happens from keeping your soil too moist for too long. So you can see that this is just pure neglect. These have not been treated very nicely. I have barely, I've overwatered them in an attempt to keep them alive, which has caused um, us to have algae growing on top of the soil. They need to be fertilized. They're definitely getting munched down as well. So they need to be sprayed. So a lot of things need to happen here. Now, Let's talk about how I would fix this. If you were a brand new gardener, it is likely that your trays might look like this the first year. Totally okay, there are things that you can do to remedy it. First thing I would do with this is let it dry out. You don't wanna let it dry out to the point where your plants are limp and wilting, but you need to let some of that moisture in the soil evaporate and, and hold off on watering for maybe a day, maybe two, depending on where you are. The other thing that I would do with these guys is when I, the next time I do water, I would fertilize. You can see the yellowing, the stuntedness, they're really not looking good. They, they need some extra uh, fertilizer. You can see here, this is what they should look like. That's what they look, some of these look like currently. That's a big difference. Another thing that you can do to help with the fungal issue and the insects is make sure they're getting enough airflow. So if you are starting in an area where you can set up just a small box fan on a low setting, the airflow across the plants is really helpful because it actually works the plants and builds more uh, turgidity in their cell wall. So it actually makes them stronger. It's like them lifting um, weights and making them stronger and it's going to blow some of the insects off that are trying to lay eggs it's also going to dry out the top layer of the soil which is going to prevent more algae from growing it's just a really good idea to have good airflow you don't want stagnant water and stagnant air around your starts if possible these can totally be saved they will be saved i will make sure that they get the love that they need but for the purpose of this video i wanted to show you what neglected starts look like this is a very common easy mistake to make now in contrast here's a very good looking row of, of starts uh, these guys are very happy they're very healthy they're very green i have fertilized regularly they're ready to go in the ground they look amazing this is what all of your starts should look like. And if you avoid those most common four mistakes that people make, you're going to have beautiful starts like this. Now we know starting from seed, it's a little bit of work. It is totally a learning curve and it can be frustrating, but the trade-off is it's much more economical. You can grow varieties that you simply cannot find in the stores. You can ensure that they're 100% organic and pesticide free so that when you plant them out in your garden, you feel really confident about it. And I'm telling you, once you get the hang of it, it's really, really fun.